give it a couple of seconds here while everybody starts to file on in. See 46, 47, 48. We'll give it we'll give it a full minute here and then we'll get started. Hello, Stephen. Okay. Looks like we've got a good number of people already in the webinar. I'm sure other people will, will join us, but in the interest of uh, respecting everyone's time and using the full hour that we have here, let's, uh, let's get underway. Uh, welcome. My name is Chris Winter, and I'm the Director for Domestic Programs and Safe Sport with Athletics Canada. And welcome to tonight's webinar uh, called Super Shoes, Fast Feet or Faster Footwear. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that while we're gathering virtually, the land on which I'm speaking to you from uh, is the unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Uh, just a couple of things before we begin. Uh, you guys will notice that you're muted, uh, but that doesn't mean you can't ask questions. We uh, encourage you to please put them into the dialog box on the screen uh, and we'll get to them when we, we can. Uh, if you're attending to us and you're uh, French speaking, you're more than welcome to ask those questions in French and John will uh, help translate those and, and get an answer for you. Uh, we'll leave about 15 minutes for, to answer questions at the end and we'll do our best to get to all of your questions. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be posted in the coming days on the Athletics Canada uh, website under our coaching section under e-learning. Uh, and hopefully, and finally, uh, all those coaches in attendance will have their NCCB and who provided their NCCB number will receive one PD point for their participation. So getting underway here, I'll first uh, introduce uh, our great panel of guests for this evening. Uh, we're joined first by uh, Jane Edstrom, who currently serves as the chair for our national officials committee and is a national master trainer for mentors, evaluators, and clinicians. She has uh, officiated in Canada for over 40 years and as a World Athletics ITO lecturer and evaluator. She's officiated at numerous world championships, both indoor and outdoor, uh, Commonwealth Games, Pan Am Games, Youth Olympic Games, Diamond Leagues, National Championships, and Olympic Games. Just next month, she'll be traveling to the Tokyo Olympics to serve as a secretary to the jury, and will be one of three technical delegates for the Oregon 22 World Championships in Eugene. Jane, uh, in addition to her officiating, is uh, recently retired from 35 years as a high school physical educator. Next up is uh, Nate Reich, who is the T38 world record holder in the 800 meters and 1500 meters uh, and a Paralympian. Uh, Nate is getting, his, uh, getting set for his second Olympic Games in which uh, he's looking in good form, smashing his uh, world record twice this year already. Uh, and Nathan is currently training at the West Coast Endurance Hub with his coach Heather Henniger and off the track, he aligns himself with the Children's Miracle Network and Canadian Paralympic Committee. His underlying goal is to help push Paralympic movement in conjunction with motivating and inspiring the next generation of para-athletes. Next up is Shalaya Kitt. She is a PhD candidate at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, BC in the Department of Kinesiology. She studies how exercise influences cardiorespiratory functions and the implications for health and performance. Previously, Shalaya completed her master's degree in integrative physiology at the University of Colorado in Boulder, where she studied the biome biomechanics of running. Shalaya is a competitive runner and she specialized in the 3000 meter steeplechase where she's represented the United States at the 2012 Olympic Games, 2013 World Championships, and she was second at our 2015 Pan American Games. Next up is Alex Hutchinson, also known as Pat Sweat Science if you're on social media, and is a science journalist who writes about endurance sports for the outs for, uh, outside the Global Mail and Canadian Running. His most recent book was the New York Times bestseller, Endure, mind, body, and curiously elastic limits of human performance. He's a former middle distance runner and lives in Toronto. Last but not least, we've had to sub in, not, not last but least, but uh, we had to sub in John LaFranco. Lindy Elmore was scheduled to attend, but she's actually currently traveling uh, down to Vancouver to take part in tomorrow's 10,000 meter 
uh, championships. So we have John. John is a coach, uh, a coach and educator. He's the manager of coaching education and development for Athletics Canada. <laughs> and he's also, uh, sorry, Athletics Canada, the national sport organization for track and field and coach for aspiring Olympians, university and high school student athletes uh, and anyone else that's interested in bettering themselves through the sport. He's also a 16 year member and part-time faculty in Concordia's English department, department and holds bachelor's in common and civil law from McGill. Okay, enough for me, lots of talking, but uh, look forward to, to diving in. We're really uh, fortunate to have this panel of, of guests. There's a lot of expertise here, uh, and hopefully we can have a really uh, engaging conversation over the next 45 minutes to an hour where we can hopefully ask lots of questions. Uh, you know, we're, I've got a, a list of questions that will kind of run us through, but I, I think we can go in a lot of different directions here, depending on what the audience is keen to learn from. So. Don't be afraid to, to stray from where, where we're going and ask any questions that you find uh, you want to explore. I think uh, uh, the best place to start is always from the beginning. So uh, I'm going to pass it over to Shalea just to give us a quick brief overview of kind of what these super, super, shears, are, super shoes are and, uh, and we'll go from there. So over to you Shalea, thank you. Yeah, thanks Chris. Um, so what a super shoe is. Um, it's probably this colloquial term we've come up with as a uh, track community or running community. Um, and the first time I saw a super shoe would have been that Nike Vaporfly. And we used to only talk about the Nike Vaporfly as kind of this um, new shoe that was really changing the way people ran and changing the way people performed. Um, it was a marathon shoe, but as we've seen, uh, shoe technology has advanced and uh, shoe companies have broadened that into um, sprint spikes, middle distance spikes, and long distance spikes even for the track. So a super shoe really is anything that has been uh, advancing performance to a greater magnitude than we've ever seen before. That's my, that's my super shoe in a nutshell. Well, that, that's great. And, and would it be fair to say that a super shoe would generally have a, a stack height of 40 millimeters or does it? Can oh, that... you want to get into stack height already, Chris? Sure, let's jump into it. Uh, <laughs> But just yeah. so people have, a, I guess, uh, maybe a visual of what, what, what it is they're looking at there. Yeah, sure. Um, I guess one of the defining features was we saw that in the original Vaporfly or our first super shoe was that it had um, this really thick uh, midfoam. Um, and people really attributed a lot of um, this performance uh, capability to being that foam. And then also knowing that there was an embedded plate in there. Um, so with that high amount of foam or stack height uh, that got up to about 40 millimeters. Uh, people really attributed a lot of that to what was causing these um, huge jumps in performance. So when you see a thick shoe, a lot of people think, ah, super. That, that's great. And, and I guess we can also say that now there's the super shoe technology, what began on the road in a racing flat is now transitioned over into to spikes. And we're seeing a bit of that on, on the track these days. Is that kind of fair to say? Yeah, that's totally fair to say. I mean, and I guess since we're just starting to snowball into it, I mean, it wasn't just that, you know, we started putting more foam on shoes. It was the types of foam we started using. Um, so people were really used to that traditional EBA foam. And then all of a sudden in 2016, Nike came out with this Vaporfly prototype shoe and the foams really started to, to change. We started using this PBAX foam. Um, which was completely different. Um, it's a very lightweight foam. Um, it, it's super compliant. So um, when you compressed it, it would store a lot of energy. And then we also knew it was really resilient. So you can compress it, but it really matters how much energy it's giving back. So we started seeing shoes that were super tall. And then when you squished them down, it would store energy and then it would return a lot of that energy to the runner. That's great. Alex, you want to jump in? Yeah, can I ask a quick question, Shalaya? Um, wh what is... What is it that the super shoes, the, the marathon shoes have in common with the track spikes? Is it the, because track spikes have had stiff plates before, is, is it the resilience of the foam rather than the thickness? Is it resilient foam is the common family relationship? You know, I'm, I'm kind of with you on that because plates aren't new to spikes. Um, and I think it is that resilience of the foam, but I haven't seen anyone test that yet. Um, I'm sure someone's out there doing that, just compressing a spike in an instrument or something, uh, but I don't know for sure. Thanks. Alex, I'm going to go over to you just off of what Shalea was just saying there, because I was reading an interesting article that you, you were uh, quoted in talking about is that, you know, what, what makes these shoes uh, so controversial in, in a way? I mean, 
the, the article I read from you, it kind of broke down that it, that the carbon fiber plate wasn't new, the super resilient foam wasn't new, uh, stack heights wasn't new. Um, so, you know, maybe elaborate a little bit on that in terms of what we're seeing here with this new technology and what's kind of caused this controversy. Yeah, I mean, that question is hard to answer because as, as, as my question illustrates, we don't necessarily really know exactly what it is that's the secret sauce, but yeah, to, the, to your point, like the, with the Vaporfly, there were three three key components, I would say, that made it different from previous shoes, which was an embedded full-length carbon fiber plate, uh, a thick, really thick midsole for a racing shoe, and then the, the material the material of this midsole, which was super light and super resilient. All of those ingredients in various forms had been incorporated in, in shoes before, um, at, you know, if, for as long as, let's say, 20 years, 30 years, although the the, the super, like, probably the best forerunner to the foam, the Nike foam was Adidas's boost foam. And that was only maybe five or six years before. But so there was, there, there's more than just someone discovered a new ingredient. It's the way these ingredients were combined. Uh, it's the, the exact recipe just, man, it just got it right, which is why it's sort of, I, I'm still struggling to understand how the track spikes work because um, what what I thought must be the magic in the, in the marathon shoes that it doesn't seem to apply in the track shoes. And yet the track shoes are producing very fast times. So all of which is to say, uh, you know, the fairness argument is uh, probably we don't want to go down that ra rabbit hole here, but I, I don't think you can say the, these shoes have something in them that is demonstrably different than shoes had before. It's just for what, in whatever way they work, they work in some way and world athletics makes the rules. They could have banned them uh, and that wouldn't have been crazy. They didn't. They, they put in some limits. So we, I think as coaches and athletes, everyone needs to, to understand what the rules are, work within them and, and kind of from a competitive perspective, I would say not lose too much energy worrying about, you know, whether God intended shoes to look like this. So this is what the rules are. Um, figure out what works for you and how you can, uh, you know, use those to your advantage as best as possible. That's a, that's a great segue. And I think we will use that to, to jump into to Jane and, and have her come on, come on and talk to us a little bit about the rules in terms of how they've been uh, enacted by World Athletics and how they're being uh, played out today. But there, there is a good comment in the chat here from Carmen just asking, you know, how do the uh, Hoka shoes compare? They are thick, but they don't, they, do they use a different foam? So kind of back to you, Alex, where the, again, that wasn't the new technology. There was a, There is other shoes out there that have a high stack height but for you, what you're saying there is it's kind of this magic of those kind of three different uh, technologies interplaying together. Uh, and the Hoka foam is, um, I mean, I don't want to say, I don't want to say bad things about Hoka, but it's not as light and it's not as resilient. It's, it was a fairly conventional foam. So um, it, it does some of the things in terms of maybe preventing legs from getting trashed with long, hard training, but it, it's, you lose some efficiency because they're, they're heavy. Um, and they also didn't have a carbon fiber plate in for better or worse. So maybe you lose a, 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 it becomes a sort of a mushier shoe that doesn't um, translate your forces efficiently to the ground. So that yeah, that's a that's a perfect example of one of the ingredients that was out there before, and no one thought that was unfair. Right. So Jane, yeah, let's let's hop over to you, and and I know you're going to kind of quickly touch base on on what the rules are and, and how they've been implemented by World Athletics. Um, thank you, Chris. Yes, um, maybe I'm the bad person here in that I am. Uh, the, the rules person. Um, and just while I'm getting my screen up to share, I've just got a couple of slides to um, demonstrate the, uh, the rule. Um, hopefully it's coming up. There we go. Yep. Um, World Athletics, this, this rule uh, came into effect uh, previous to the um, Tokyo Olympics that were supposed to happen last summer. And um, even since uh, last summer, the, the rule is fluid. It, there, there have been a number of um, revisions and changes and the rule from this day forward will not even be printed in the rule book because it is so fluid. They've got a working uh, group um, dealing with it from shoe manufacturers to coaches, to athletes, to um, uh, officials. To, to make it as fair as possible for everybody. And, and I know that's kind of a sliding scale, but um, that's sort of the background as to why this happened. Now I've lost my cursor, here we go. Um, and we're, Athletics Canada has asked the National Officials Committee to um, prepare a document to 
outline the implementation of the shoe rule, how it should be handled in Canada. So that's where some of this, and this is a really abbreviated version of that. But um, for um, sake of argument, the, the shoe must not give athletes any unfair assistance or advantage. And I've just got to get rid of my gallery view here because I can't see the slide. Um, any type of shoe must be reasonably available to all in the spirit of universality of athletics. Shoes must be available on the open market four months prior to use. Shoes to be used in competition must be on the World Athletic Shoe Compliance List or be a legacy or vintage model that is compliant with World Athletics Shoe Rule, uh, Technical Rule 5. Athletes are responsible for checking the World Athletics website for the shoe compliance list to ensure their shoes are included on the list or are otherwise compliant with rule TR5. And just so you know, that list is updated monthly. So um, if, if your shoes aren't on it this month, they might be like next month. So it is, as I say, very, very fluid. They're getting shoes uh, daily to, be, uh, to check, be checked. Shoe rule is ap applicable to elite athletes in elite competitions. Just for a rule clarification from World Athletics, um, they have stated that the rule is to be enforced at U20 and senior national championships, as well as any World Athletics, NACAC, permit or label events. All Associates of Can Athletics Canada are subject to compliance with the uh, rule. At the competition, the athlete or representative must present shoes to be worn at the competition to, to the technical information center prior to competition. And the reason we put this in is so that if, you're, if the shoes were not on the compliance list, the athlete can, has a day to um, try to get a, a pair of shoes that are compliant and can compete. If, if they show up at the call room with non-compliant shoes, there's no chance to go out and buy a new pair. If shoes are on the World Athletic Shoe Compliance List or are otherwise compliant with uh, the Technical Rule 5, they can be used. Athletes must still report to the call room and present the shoes for thorough inspection prior to the event. If the shoes are not on the World Athletic Shoe Compliance List or are otherwise non-compliant with Rule the technical rule five, they cannot be used in competition. Prior to the event in the meet call room, the shoes will be inspected for the number of spikes, length, width, and type of spikes, sole and heel thicknesses, and cross-referenced with the World Athletic Shoe Compliance List. Sanctioning and penalties. If an athlete or representative fails to present their shoes to the technical information center as outlined, in, as outlined and the shoes are found to be non-compliant, there is no opportunity to compete. If an athlete competes with non-compliant shoes or is deemed to have done so after the fact, the referee may disqualify the athlete after the event. And that's according to competition rule um, 5.12. Any athlete who is found to have contravened the rules is liable to retroactive disqualification and the removal of performances claimed for records, rankings, and or standards. Uh, just a, a proviso, our, as officials, we're, we're not there to disqualify athletes or to take performances away. Our goal is to make the athletes, coaches of, uh, aware of this rule so that they compete in compliant shoes. And if they make a standard, that that standard will stand. Um, and uh, so without a further ado, I'll, I'll leave that. Uh, and you well, can mull that over. That's, that's great, Jane. And then that's a yeah, really important comment uh, that you made at the end there. And then also the comment about really 
this this whole thing and why you know we definitely wanted to have you on on the, the webinar today was just make people aware to grow awareness because the last thing we want is an athlete showing up at a competition especially an important one and not having the appropriate footwear so this is a rule that's come down from world athletics and we're all just trying to wrap our head around it in terms of how to implement we do actually have a question uh, on that point from an official that's attending the webinar really trying to understand how from an official's perspective how they go about identifying these shoes do they all of a sudden have to become this uh you know expert of every type of shoe model you know under the sun or or what what's the kind of officials uh mindset around trying to implement this well i think it's it's the the call rooms responsibility to, to to measure the shoes um just like in previous they they measure well they look at the number of spikes they look at spike length and now we've added one more dimension and and that's the sole and the heel thickness so they're measuring that um and as um Shaylin and alex have already mentioned you can kind of identify them because they're a little higher they're stacked uh you know, and, and, and so it, it's not kind of a surprise. Yeah, no, that, that's great. Thanks, Jane. So uh, Alex, as you've taken a sip, I was going to, you know, pass it over to you and, and just as a comment, you know, now that World Athletics has come down with this, this new rules and implementation is, is this a little too little, uh, sorry, a little too late for this? Or do you feel like this is the, the kind of the right balance that World Athletics has struck by uh, putting this sort of uh, regulations in place? What's your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I don't envy the officials. It's, it's like, that's going to be a lot of, I should invest in caliper companies uh, for everyone who's going to be buying calipers to measure these shoes. Um, you know, like I, if it was me, I probably would have made the stack height limit a little bit lower uh, uh, for road shoes. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, it would have been really hard to put the genie back in the bottle. They, they made a rule, I think the purpose of the rule, and I hope it succeeds in that, is to say, okay, we've we've had this shift in times. Uh, let's not make it happen every year. Let's let's try and constrain future innovation. But they've decided to allow everything that's happened. And um, yeah, if, if I if I had, I, I would have maybe tightened those rules a little bit. But um, yeah, I just I, I, I whatever they set the rules. I, honestly, it doesn't matter that much to me as long as everyone's has. It, I think the access question is far more important than the details of what the rule is. And the access was a problem in 2016 and 2017 um, to a lesser extent in 2018. It's a problem now for track spikes, I would say, for people. Um, so the road shoot, the road situation has stabilized. Uh, the track situation, people I've talking to, are, talking to are still having trouble getting, if they're not sponsored or enormously rich, having trouble getting the Nike spikes and the other companies have, despite rumors, I, I, I don't know if Adidas' shoes have landed yet. So anyway, I, I worry about what's going to happen at the, at the Olympics, for, especially for athletes who are constrained contractually to, to run with other shoes. So that, that I would be worried more about that than about the details of the, of the dimensions. That's a really good point. Shalaya, do you have anything to add to that or is that? Well, unlike Alex, I don't think uh, constraining the stack height would have done too much more. Um, I don't think there's a lot of evidence that increasing it further or any of that actually gave more of an advantage to some athletes. Um, there, there's early studies done in the early 2010s or so where people ran with extra foam and it could be actually detrimental. You add mass to the shoe that way um, and you don't always get this energy saving. So I'm not, I'm not quite in the same mindset that limiting stack height would have helped. Um, you also start increasing, increasing stack height. Um, it becomes unstable for the, the runner. Um, I, I do, I am a fan of the um, four months on the market the shoe has to be on um, and making it readily available. I wish that was a little more defined. Um, but yeah, I think the dimension's not going to do too much. There's a question here from Lynn saying, can we assume that the shoes that are readily available that you can find in running specialty stores are not the shoes that are in question, but rather shoes that have sponsored athletes have made specially for them? Well, I think it, it's kind of both, and, and Jane can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, the the, these super shoes now have uh, restrictions in terms of which events they can be used in. So you could go buy them from the run specialty store, but you wouldn't be allowed to wear them in a 10,000 meter or 5,000 meter on the track. Um, and then to the point of, in terms of being commercially available, it does get to that point there, Lynn, where uh, correct that shoes where athletes in the past may have had these bespoke uh, prototypes made for them. There is now restrictions on that. Just, yes, Chris, further to that, uh, for sure. Um, if, if an athlete has a prototype made for them, 
it has to be submitted to World Athletics and, and they're going to slice it open and, and make sure that it meets all the criteria, as well as you have to prove that it has been available to the public, quote, in quotes, the public four months prior. So it, it doesn't limit having these athletes prototypes, but you have to open it up to everybody. Nate, I'm curious to go over to you and hear from you as an athlete that's actually worn these. Uh, it's amazing how quickly the world has changed. And I, I retired in 2016, and I've have never actually put these shoes on my feet. So it shows how quickly uh, things things change, right? Um, so I'm curious, Nate, to just kind of get a, a hear from you as an athlete. You know, what what has it been like? You know, having these shoes come onto the market uh, and wear them in training and racing uh, from from your perspective. Yeah, it's been, it's been interesting. Um, you know, at first I think I was kind of against them. Um, and I was kind of going to wait and see what my competition did, um, to make that, to make that decision. And I was, yeah, I, I was like, are they really that good? Was, I guess, kind of the question that I was waiting to answer. Um, and then a couple of my competitors ran five or six second PBs. Um, and I was like, all right. Um, I texted one of my friends who runs for Nike and asked what he thought of them um, and then kind of got them. Um, but I usually don't really practice in them. Um, I like, I think like anything like treatment, like I don't want to be reliant on something um, because I feel like that can be a, be a detriment down the road. Um, but they are, they are helpful. I mean, I don't think... In the last three years, I haven't broken through 55, and the last four performances I've had um, have all been under 355. Um, so, and gone as low as 247. So, um, they definitely help. Um, I think we also have to put in con consideration during the pandemic. Um, haven't had a lot of race opportunities, and I think um, this is my personal opinion. I think rest did amazing things uh, for the sport of track and field. I think a lot of times we're overtrained. And so I think it gave a lot of athletes time to actually heal those, those injuries and actually go a hundred percent. And uh, you're rarely a hundred percent, especially near the championships. Oh, that's great. And so just judging from what you're talking there, you seem to be specifically talking about the, the new spikes. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And do you wear the, the, a large stack I'd choose at all for, for training, tempo runs, bar licks or anything I've like that? Them, uh, before I've ran one 5k in them. Um, but yeah, I try not to use them. Um, honestly, I like to kind of, it's hard to compare times um, for specifically threshold. Um, as um, many of us know for the 1500, really 800 up, the aerobic works really important. And I personally like to be able to compare those um so i feel like at first i got excited and i might have worn them a couple times but i've kind of uh kind of had to sit down and really uh make it for myself so is it, if i'm hearing you correctly is there almost kind of like you you'll you'll have i don't know two two sets of kind of workout um benchmarks in your mind you'll have the workouts that you do wearing those shoes keep that kind of separate from the the days you don't wear those shoes that that sort of thing because you can't really compare apples to apples there yeah definitely i think like the only times i'll wear spikes the super spikes in practice is if it's like 1500 1500 specific and it's like very short rest and it's really close to the race uh because i do believe you do need to wear the spikes that you're going to race in a couple times um but yeah i definitely do that's great so i'm curious to, to head over to john the, the coach in the room here and just kind of talk about how you've seen the development of these shoes in terms of how it's had an impact on you in terms of your, uh, your periodization and your planning with your athletes and, and how you go about adopting these shoes and kind of where I kind of, when we were talking about this, this session in general, we kind of wanted to stay away from the, the controversy and really just kind of look about how these shoes have basically become a new tool and the toolkit for athletes and coaches. And so I'm kind of curious to just hear from you, John, in terms of, you know, how these shoes have kind of fit into things, how, how you're, how you've kind of, I guess, uh, uh, learned about the shoes and, and uh, learned to kind of, I guess, manage them in your, your athlete's training. Yeah. I mean, the, the shoes came into my view, I guess, at the 2018 Chicago marathon. 
Um, the two women I, I coached that ran there both wore them uh, cold for the first time out of the box at the race. Uh, Melanie finished ninth and beat Gwen Jorgensen. I don't know if she was wearing the shoes too. <laughs> uh, and uh, Shelly ran a big PB 238 and, and finished 15th. You know, and it's kind of like, that's like the one, like never, you know, wear a new pair of shoes for a marathon. It's kind of like one of the most sort of basic things that, that people might say, but they were, they were keen. Like they had heard a lot about it and, and they, there was even a bit of, you know, kind of running around the day before uh, at the expo trying to, you know, trying to get a pair and that sort of thing. Um, so there was hype. And so I think as a coach, my role at that time was to kind of maybe temper expectations a bit in terms of like, if you don't get them, um, you know, that's fine. Like you've still prepared for this race and it's not, you know, gonna, you know, make or break your race or anything like that. I mean, you know, a couple very experienced, mature women, but still like when it comes to the day before the marathon, people are, people are stressed. Um, but in the end they, they wore them and, and it was great. And there might've been a bit of extra soreness after, um, but it's hard to know, you know, in, in retrospect, if it's because of that, or it's because, you know, you just ran like the fastest marathon in your life. So you're pushing yourself a bit more. So, I mean, I think that, you know, after that, like it, having the opportunity to kind of start from scratch and then kind of the next build, you know, the thinking was like, if you're going to get them, try them, you know, on an easy run, just to see what happens. Um, and then, you know, maybe work them into sort of a longer, longer tempo workouts. What the athletes told me is, you know, it makes more sense to, to do them for long tempos for intervals. It's kind of, they don't, didn't really feel like it was, it was great. I think there's been sort of negative feedback in terms of like turns and things like that. Um, I think we saw people falling at the, the world half in Poland, like on that kind of like sharp turn and people were speculating it might be because of that because they're, they're big. Um, so yeah. And I think, you know, Mel had, had tried to maybe just use them only really on the last kind of big marathon workout, partly also, cause there was also this idea that like, they were only good for, you know, hundred K or something. Like if your normal running shoe is good for five to 800 K and, and again, maybe, you know, Shalaya and Alex can refute this or not. I don't know, but that's the you know, kind of the word on the street is like, they're only good for, you know, two races or something. So you can't, you don't want to waste them. You don't want to burn them out. Um, and that might be a little bit of a, you know, similar to what Nate is saying, like, you know, when you have your big last workout, you know, you want to get in the spikes and, and kind of get that race feel. I think the same thing would apply for, uh, for road running. Um, but like in terms of overall planning and periodization, I don't think it changes much. I think it's really just as with anything monitoring, you know, um, the athlete for any extra soreness or whatever, like as you might for any, you know, other new shoe, um, you know, and, and the, the feedback that, that we got was maybe, maybe they make hamstrings a bit sore. Um, but maybe is that because, you know, you're running a little faster, so you're putting a little more stress on. So is that the shoes or is that because you're just running faster? And so it's, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I tend to coach very, and anic not anecdotally, but like just kind of like as it comes. So when things come up, we deal with it. And that, you know, this fits into that model. So it sounds like you've been able to manage your athletes not from just becoming addicted to these shoes and having to wear them for every single session because they wore them once and then they, you know, go back to their old shoes and they can't compare to that. So that from a mental perspective, they've been able to manage that. Okay. Yeah. They didn't really, there didn't seem to be some of that. There's a couple people in the group who do wear them um, more often, but um, not with negative feedback towards, you know, the race kind of thing. Like, I don't think that they're uh, addicted to it really. It, so it seems fine. <laughs> yeah. Nate, I'm wondering just back to you, it, it when you guys are, especially in a, a base season where you're not on the track, you're not wearing spikes. Is there a little bit within the training group where athletes are kind of looking at what's, what's on each other's footwear saying, okay, you're wearing those shoes today and I'm wearing my flat, like regular trainers, you know, is there any kind of, uh, I don't know, competition or mindset, you know, around what the athletes are, are wearing on any given day? Um, I, I would say there's definitely a little bit of banter back and forth. Uh, maybe that's just cause it, that's how our, 
our environment at the West Hub is. We like to kind of joke around with each other. Mariah Kelly is definitely her and I will go back and forth with each other. Uh, she's New Balance sponsored, so a lot of times I have the more of the Nike shoes on uh, on my feet, and so um, I'll kind of uh, mess with her. Um, but um, yeah, I would say like it's more in like fun. Um, but yeah, I, I would say that we definitely check each other's feet from time to time. Yeah. Shalaya, I'm, I'm kind of curious, and, and I was reading an article in preparation for this, and it, it was interviewing uh, Jared Ward, who's done a lot of kind of research uh, on his own uh, footwear, and he's sponsored by Saucony, and they've done a lot of research on that. And one thing that he was talking about is that, you know, when an athlete decides to, to wear these all the time, it, it has a, the impact is that they, they don't feel as beat up after a long, hard training in them. And his comment around that is that maybe not necessarily a good thing, especially if you're preparing for something like a marathon where you know, going through and getting that, uh, you know, building up those that callus to, to the long mileage and the training. Uh, so he says that he often wouldn't wear those shoes because he wants to, uh, I guess, yeah, uh, sorry, the, the words are escaping me, but he wants to just be able to uh, train his legs to be able to handle the punishment of a marathon. Is there any, any kind of truth to that? Any comments from your end? No, but I've heard a lot of athletes say the same thing as when you wear a super shoe or a vapor fly shoe, um, or, uh, typically the next day you don't feel as beat up. You're, you feel like you can bounce back quicker. Um, I know I ran in the vapor fly for some 10 Ks and I was surprised how great I felt the next day. Um, but I don't know if we actually have any science to back that up yet. Unless I've missed something and Alex, you've read something that I haven't seen lately. There was like a conference presentation at the biomechanics meeting in Kananaskis from, from Nike itself, where they had people do parallel training sessions with and without the, the vapor flies and the people who ran the vapor flies were able to sustain a higher training load. Um, so there's a little bit of anecdotal evidence from, from Nike itself that this, uh, you know, less beat up thing is real. And I think, yeah, I mean, I think it's all theoretical at this point, like, is that a great thing because you can accumulate more training or is it you're missing out on an opportunity to, to harden up your legs? And I think it's, it falls into the same category as all these debates about should you train with like full carbs or, or carb depleted, you know, all, all these sorts of things. Like, do you want to make yourself suffer or do you want to make yourself run faster? And I don't think there's a, 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 a solid answer. What I would say is maybe you use that to think carefully on an individual basis. Are you an athlete who has fallen apart in the last 10 K of a marathon and you're really really do think you need to work on getting your bag legs to be able to handle it? Or are you an athlete who's had trouble uh, handling higher training loads uh, that you just, you, you can't. And so maybe a shoe that's a little more forgiving on the body is going to allow you to sustain higher training loads and get more cardiovascular benefit. And you make the, so I don't think it's like, it's all good or all bad. I think it's just maybe, are you tilting towards cushioning your, you know, babying yourself in training or are you saying, no, I want to, I, you know, I want to be tough and do it the hard way and, and run on, you know, nails and bare feet or whatever. Yeah. Cause that, that's kind of my impression as, you know, thinking about the, you know, the weeks leading up to the marathon, whatever the three, four months, I guess. And thinking about like he, the training for marathon is hard. And the challenge sometimes is that people do great in the training, but they just leave it all out there and they don't have anything left for the race. So if, if the shoes are allowing you to put in the work and you're not as tired coming into the race and you have more on the day, I think that's potentially a positive. Um, but again, my impression just, you know, again, anecdotally with a couple people, uh, training is that, um, yeah, because they were able to go a little quicker, they had the impression that they were a little more sore, but maybe it's not. Like I said, maybe it's not the shoe. So I, I kind of agree with Alex. Like it's, it's going to depend on the athlete and their, their approach to, to things and, and what they, what their weaknesses are and what their strengths are and what they, what they need. Well, one other thing I would just say is that w w these are the same considerations we've faced forever with like training in spikes versus training in flats versus training in trainers. And there's pros and cons to, to putting on the, the spikes three times a week. But the other thing is like, there, there are the stories that go around about, oh, the super shoes that they're going to, you know, destroy your, your Achilles or whatever. Um, I don't think there's anything uniquely evil about the super shoes that are going to make you more in injured, but they're different, just like spikes are different from trainers. And if, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't go from base season to start training in spikes three times a week 
at least you shouldn't probably, unless you've already shown that you can do it twice a week without any trouble. And before, before that, do it once a week. And I would take the same approach with these sorts of shoes. If you can afford to run in them multiple times a week, that doesn't mean you should, unless you, unless you've eased into it without, you know, tweaking your hamstring or your Achilles or whatever the case may be. I, I went personally for one run in a, it, it's not even, it's whatever the, the, like the fake one is. It's like a high, it's just a high stack. I chew, I guess by Nike. I don't know if it even has the real foam. And it messed up my Achilles. I can't run in that. I have to run in lower drop shoes. Can't do it. <laughs> so, no. So, Leigh, I know this is an area you've got specific, you know, expertise and put a lot of research into it. What have you seen in terms of injuries around wearing these shoes, specifically the, the big stack height and, and vapor flies? Yeah, I really like everything Alex and John have just said. I mean, you need to remember injuries occur from, you know, repetitive loading on a, on a certain joint or a certain area. And if you haven't created any adaptations for your body to be able to handle that, that's what's going to cause an injury. So jumping into, you know, a, a shoe that really changes your mechanics um, and you're wearing that three, five times a week, um, sure, that's going to lead to, you know, so, some problems. Um, I guess you asked more specifically biomechanically, what have we seen in the lab? Um, and obviously the shoe I'm most familiar with is the Nike Vaporfly. Um, the, the biggest changes was, uh, since that shoe is stiffer and taller, um, we know it reduces the, uh, joint power around your metatarsal, fa uh, phalangeal joint. Um, that's where I got, I got my friend's foot over here, actually. Yeah. That's not, that's, uh, that's the joints down here by your toes. Um, and so it makes it a lot stiffer. Um, and, and so that's one reason that maybe we start to see some, some changes in the foot people report. Um, more strained arches, uh, it's uncomfortable on the ball of their foot. Um, and we also know that it can uh, change or reduce the power around um, your, uh, your calf joint. So another reason that maybe that people report more Achilles injuries, uh, you jump into a shoe too fast, you are changing something and your body has not had time to adapt yet. Well, I think it was one article I saw that you, you used a, a good quote that it was that you know, it, it feels like you have less stress on certain areas. So your Achilles or your calves, but as you said, it's like that stress has to go somewhere. So it, I think you said it ends up going to more of the metatarsal foot or something like that. There's no such thing as a free lunch. That's for sure. Yeah. That, that's great. Um, yeah. Let's see where we're, we've we got a couple of questions that are coming in. I just want to see if anything that's, we should be answering as we're coming along here. Um, there was a question about the, the, the height of the track shoes. And I think it is, I don't know if we've mentioned that the, there's a different stack height limit on the, on the track spikes, which is, if I'm remembering correctly, it's 25 millimeters. So they won't, they won't look as big. Um, but it is different than, you know, certainly what I ran on the track, on the track in. And then there was a question around any, any studies on the extra performance enhancements of the spike specifically. And I know we were talking a bit about this before we came in, uh, but maybe Shalia just touch on that quickly. On the spike specifically, I don't know of any, um, not yet. I'm sure there are some in the works. Um, earlier, I guess, uh, Kyle Barnes's group up at uh, Grand Rapids University did look at a spike compared to Vaporfly. Um, I mean, a spike's lighter and it, it, he wasn't looking for mid distance or you know track performance. Um, he was looking more at uh, energetic long-term costs and uh, there wasn't a huge difference there. One thing to note is that the, the studies they, that Shalea and her colleagues did with the Vaporfly can only be done basically at, at threshold speeds or below. So that's why, presumably why there isn't this sort of, uh, you know, headline study calling it the, you know, Nike spike 5% or 2% or whatever it is, because it you can't do that test. So you, only, you can only have sort of indirect tests to figure out how, how fast these spikes are and the indirect tests are much harder to do cleanly. Um, so I, I don't, barring any sort of advances, I don't know, but I don't think we're going to get as clear an answer about the spikes in the, in the near, you know, in, in, in the next few years as we got with the, with the road shoes. And so we're just, we're kind of have to have this, in, this guessing game for quite a while of like, well, the records came down by X percent. Or whatever. <laughs> Thanks Alex. Yeah. I'm, I'm always talking about like the aerobic zones when someone's running and it, it's still kind of conversation pace. Um, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, a great comment in the chat here from Dave uh, saying, what about the idea that a less efficient runner gains more from a super shoe compared to an efficient runner? I think I saw something, maybe Shalea, I think I saw something that you've, you've looked at this a little bit. 
Yeah, and I, I don't, um, I'm trying to think of the less efficient runners, what I'd call it. Um, I, we've done some modeling, some simulations saying that a slower runner that runs a slower marathon might actually get a, big, a bigger percent improvement in performance using a super shoe than someone that's already running at really fast speeds. So from that sense, you know, someone at three, four hour marathon pace definitely will see a, you know, a bigger bump in PR than someone that's already close to, you know, 210 or something. It That's is great. maybe worth mentioning individual variation and, and Melinda Elmore shows up in the chat here. Every runner is different. Every runner gets, so when, when the, in, you know, in Chilea study, 4% doesn't mean everyone got 4%. Uh, I can't remember. It was like two to 6%. Yeah. Two to 6%. Like yeah. And I, I had a, I remember I had a chat with uh, Jos Hermans, the, the, the agent who is the agent for both Ken and Issa Bikili and Elliot Kipchoge. And his, he said, look, Kipchoge got a huge, a much bigger boost from the original Vaporfly than um, than Bikili did. And, and that's just the way it goes. And so the, the, the Melinda Elmore story is that she, when she was contemplating her options, she took a Saucony shoe and a Nike shoe into the lab and tested them, did, did running economy tests and found for her, they were essentially the same. So that made, allowed her to just make the decision independent of, of, uh, uh, of, of the shoe performance. But so the, there may be, and as, as Lynn is pointing out in the comments here, there's, there's a number of different models of these shoes and the best shoe for you, for, for your athlete or for any individual person might not be, uh, the same as for their club mate or their teammate or whatever. So, uh, it's, I mean, well, it's, it's not really financially possible to say, well, I'm going to try out seven of these shoes and, and, uh, see which one's best, but don't assume that the one, the, the shoe that's best for someone else is the best for you. And if it doesn't feel like it's working for you, you, you may be right. You know, you may be right that it, that a shoe is just not working with your stride, but I don't think the general patterns that people have proposed all sorts of patterns that more efficient or light people or heavy people or tall people or wide people, or, you know, whatever the case, toe strikers, heel strikers. Um, I, I haven't seen any consistent patterns from study to study. There's, I don't know any guidance to say this shoe will work better for this kind of person. That's great. And uh, yeah, I think it's important, obviously, to, to Lynn's comment there in the chat is that, you know, these, the other companies have now added four or five years to, to play catch up and it still think that the feeling out there is that Nike's still probably on top, but the other shoes have, have definitely closed the gap. And that's why we're seeing, you know, some incredible performances, you know, across the board, but they may not be wearing the Nike shoes. The other comment that I, I I've, and it's obvious, but the interesting thing for, for most people is that you, you only get the PB once, right? It, like that, that 4% increase, it only happened one time. It doesn't keep happening over and over and over again. So, um, yeah, at some point we likely will see a plateau here and that kind of, uh, uh, segues into my, to my next question here and, and really maybe over to you, Alex, in terms of, you know, what does the future hold, uh, for this? Are, are we, are we going to see ourselves at a plateau, uh, right for the, the, the current time, or do we think that there's going to be something down the, the pipeline that'll constantly change, uh, you know, athlete performance going forward? I, I hope we're at a plateau. Uh, I think we are, but I, I'm, if you'd asked me every year since like the year 2000, I would have said, oh, the marathon record's not going to come down, you know, this year. And then it's come down like 13 times. So um, you never know, you never know, uh, like, it, 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 but it, it's not obvious to me what the next advance would ad, advance would be, or, or, you know, we've got the, the spikes or, or the, the plates rather and, and the, the foam. So um, I'm optimistic that, the, that we'll be entering a period of relative calm once the track spike situation sort of equilibrates. Delia, what, what about you? Is there anything you're seeing with your crystal ball into, into the future? Are we, are we at a plateau? Are we going to see a plateau where things will normalize and people will kind of chill out about this whole thing? I mean, I think for a while we'll be at a plateau, but I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised, you know, if in 10 years we're talking about super shoes again, or maybe it's going to be some other type of technology that we can't even think of today. Um, it, it, it kind of excites me as a scientist, right? That's why we're in the lab. That's why people are playing around with materials. Like I kind of like seeing that stuff. I know that's the unpopular opinion, but um, yeah, I'm okay if that another decade, there's another little jump. Yeah, I, I want to go back to something Nate said about um, sort of COVID and, and rest. And I, I wonder, you know, how much of what's going on now in particular on the track are, is sort of a conflation of these things of, a different, you know, just training year because of fewer racing opportunities, the spikes themselves, and then also just the hunger of racing, like not only the scheduling and stuff, but just the fact of like, 
oh my God, I get to race. And like, I'm, you know, the, and for some people, maybe, you know, there's anxiety and apprehension, but I think for a lot of people, it's like, okay, like now I understand the opportunity that I have to race. Like every time I race, it could be, especially when you're at the highest levels, like it could be my last one. Like, and you know, like no, no one was ever thinking, oh, the Olympics would get canceled, but like, or postponed, you know? So I think maybe there's a bit of that too, that's, that's driving this sort of, I guess, spring, summers kind of big performances, um, which to me says that, you know, hopefully we can learn something from that and we don't have to go back to our old patterns of, of, you know, over, over training and over racing, if that's, if that's really what it was. So I, I think there's, it's more than just shoes. I, I will just add that in the avalanche of like amazing times over the last three years, every once in a while, you'll be like, what that guy was wearing like a paper bag on his feet. Like there's, there's these examples where someone's wearing like an old, like, like the second place finisher in the world record, or like even NCAA 5,000 where Grijalva in second ran like the Olympic standard and he, and he was wearing non super shoes. So I do, I think there's you know, like to the, whether it's the training, whether it's the sort of general sort of, there's a belief effect that, that people see the times that are running. So I, I certainly think the shoes are real, but I, I do think it's a, it's a real mistake to, to assume that every fast time is an exclusive result of, of the shoes. Cause there, there are people doing it without the shoes, uh, uh, you know, every once in a while too. That's great. Uh, we do have a, I'm just looking at the clock here. We just got less than 10 minutes to go and there's a couple of questions that have come in and we'll kind of jump around from, from different topics as a result. Uh, question for you, Jane. So, so what happens uh, if in the call room, uh, a shoe is actually led into the competition and the athlete wins. What's, uh, what's the possible ramifications there? A, a non-compliant shoe you're speaking Sorry. about? Yeah, yeah. They, a non-compliant <laughs> shoe. They get in, they race. What, what could happen? No problem. Um, the, the referee still has the right to disqualify the person after the fact. And there have even been cases where um, a day later, somebody produces video and hey, we're all on social media now, or there's always somebody taking a video of something where they produced a video and could prove that athlete X ran in a non-compliant shoe. And then that standard record performance was, was not recognized. So it's, it's not to the athlete's advantage to try to um, slip something through um, because somebody's going to catch you somewhere in, in this day and age, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. And I would say, you know, from a, a coach perspective on what Jane presented about the rules, um, it seems, it seems very clear to me. I mean, yes, it's fluid, but if you're an athlete, like you're not changing your shoes, you know, every week, you know what your shoes are. So it, it, it's not, I don't think a great burden or very difficult to, to make sure that you're competing in, in good shoes. And, and like Jane said, like the goal isn't to try to disqualify people. Um, so I, I think that it's, you know, it, it maybe it's just an extra hurdle to jump or whatever, but I, it's, yeah, I think that's. If, if, if your shoe is 45 millimeters thick or your track spike is 30 millimeters, you're stick. That didn't happen by accident. You didn't just pick the wrong pair of the closet. Like that's, th these are, these are very generous limits. Yeah. Uh, that's great. Uh, there's a question here. So it's a, it's a simple question, but so spikes or shoes on the track, uh, which event do you switch? And I think a little bit of that has to do with the new rules that are in. So you, you can't get away with wearing the vapor flies anymore. So maybe athletes going to be a little less inclined with, wearing the, the flats on, on, a in a track race, but I don't know if anyone else has any kind of comments around that now that we've seen, I mean, before, you know, a couple of years ago, we would have only seen, you know, spikes on the track unless somebody was nursing an injury. Uh, but with the, you know, the vapor fly and other super shoes, we've seen more athletes move onto the track with, with these, you know, these super shoes and obviously the new rules are going to kind of impact a bit. John. Yeah, but you can't wear them now. Right. I know. So maybe yeah. some other flat that's a, that yeah, I mean, maybe there's a super flat coming. I'm not sure that that could be one, right? Like the stack height is fine, but there's, I don't know, that'd be an interesting shoe design. Maybe I shouldn't give this information publicly. Maybe I should just go into production. And... But that's what Shalea kind of suggests, right? That the stack height's <laughs> not, maybe not as important. So, I mean, 
Who's to say yeah. they won't go and create a shoe that's 25 or 20 millimeters or whatever that upper limit is. Mm -hmm. It's a billion dollar idea right there. All right. We're recording this, right? I have, I have proof. <laughs> uh, another question here. Has COVID delayed uh, new shoe models from other manufacturers and therefore Nike sponsored athletes have an advantage? I don't know who wants to jump on that one. I think that's the, the supply chains did get, get uh, badly messed up and, and had the Olympics been last year, it would have had a big impact. Um, maybe it's, maybe it's a, that may well be a factor with the spikes that the reason it's taking so long for other companies to, to get rival spikes. Although there's also, there's always like patent issues and things like that. It's always hard to know exactly what is, what the holdup is on it, on a new set of spikes. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it, COVID has made things harder, but I think also it's just the developing a new shoe that makes people faster. is also really hard. So it's hard to, to separate what, why um, they've been a little slow to get rival spikes. Yeah, for sure. But they're out there. I mean, we've seen, you know, I think it's, uh, is it Julianne Stolle who's, she, she ran in probably the New Balance spikes and still went under 15 minutes. So it's not, not like you have to. Yeah, you're right. Spike. You're right. I should, I, I should be careful that I'm not giving a misleading thing. New Balance has good spikes. I, I think there's reports of Adidas prototypes. I just don't know if they've landed yet. So there are other spikes out there, but it's, it's getting a little down to the wire at this point. And another uh, question in here, kind of comment slash question and kind of a little uh, different than what we've been talking about, but interesting observation about pace. How much of Kipchoge's sub two hour marathon might be attributed to these shoes? Shalaya. Shalaya. <laughs> oh, putting a number on that, that's hard. Um, obviously something. Um, but he's also running at a really fast pace. Um, and so that's where it gets a little more tricky, I think, in my mind. Um, and as Alex mentioned earlier, um, some Nike people did report that he was a, a greater responder to these shoes than somebody else. So kind of all these factors together makes it kind of hard to know how much of, um, how much of that really attributed to the two hours. Obviously he trains immensely hard too, and I don't want to take that away from him. Um, but the shoes were there too. When you do the calculations of all the things that they did for breaking two, you conclude that Kipchoge is actually like a 230 guy. So then you don't really believe the, the calculations after all. Like it's, yeah, because there was the drafting and all, all this other stuff. It's, it's just impossible to separate all that, all that stuff. All these things are supposed to give minutes and minutes and minutes. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I, I agree that we, if I, if I had to put a number on it, I'd say a couple minutes. Like you know, one to two minutes, something in that, but that's just pulled out of my ear. Yeah, Nate, I got a question for you that comes in the chat here. Um, so one of the things we wonder in the store is that is is the traditional racing flat like the New Balance Hanzo or the 1400 or the Saucony Type A dead? So that kind of minimalist uh, flat, uh, that type of model, is that shoe dead or will it just be uh, fade away? So I kind of question to you: uh, Do you still keep that type of shoe in in your toolkit that still gets used for for workouts or? Have those gone the way of the dodo? Yeah, I still I still use the streak, um, mm -hmm. the OG streak, uh, which is pretty minimal. I mean, there's really barely anything to it. Um, so I personally like it. Um, I mean, I think it's a very interesting game, especially in the Paralympic kind of stream, especially in my classification. Uh, coordination impairment and fatigue that's really what we're managing that's where you see our disability and so um i mean i think we get a huge jump especially maybe even more than um able body athletes so it's it's been super intriguing to kind of play with that um and also see the results i mean seeing seven or eight second pbs is like whoa hello <laughs> <laughs> some of that came from training though we know Hopefully. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, we're a minute to the hour. Uh, obviously, if there's another question. Feel free to toss it in the chat. Uh, otherwise, we will uh, look to wrap things up. And, and and I don't know if there's any last comments from any of our panelists here that they'd want to sign off with. Uh, if somebody raises their hand or comes off mute, I'll maybe assume not. Uh, but otherwise, thank you uh, for everyone for taking time out of your, your day to speak with us. I think this has been a really good conversation. And I happy that we kind of stayed away from the, the politics of it as much as possible and kind of 
got into the implementation in terms of how athletes and coaches are, are you know, implementing this into their training programs. So six o'clock, at least on the, on the West Coast here. Everyone have a good evening. Thank you very much. And uh, look forward to catching up with all of you guys soon. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Al. Thanks, guys.